right. Good evening, everybody. Christmas has, or the countdown to Christmas has officially started because I've had my first glass of mulled wine. So, um, no, welcome um, and thank you very much for, for coming uh, this evening to the, the second of our uh, sort of a green Christmas uh, lecture series that we're intending to run um, sort of annually. Um, this is a, a joint um, sort of venture between two of the, the universities' institutes, so sort of joint hosted by the Institute for Liberal Arts and Sciences, which is very much a, an interdisciplinary sort of hub uh, within the university, and the, the fairly newly launched Institute for Sustainable Futures, um, which is really um, uh, a research institute sort of aiming to, to drive interdisciplinary research um, around a whole range of sustainability uh, themes. So um, it is you know, a great pleasure to, to welcome Johan back to, to Kiel. Um, he gave a, a keynote talk in June um, at a conference we were hosting, the annual conference for the uh, Environmental Association uh, for Universities and, and Colleges. Um, and he was so good that we thought, right, we need to get him back and we need to get a different audience uh, listening uh, to him. So, now I go for the, the biography. Um, so, Jeroen Faisy is, um, and I love this title, Professor of the Social Dimensions of Environmental Change. It just sort of trips off the tongue, doesn't it? Um, at the University of Dundee, and, and also Director of the Centre for Environmental Change and Human Resilience at Dundee. Um, he's lots of research publications across the fields of knowledge, learning, resilience, vulnerability and sustainability. Um, his works included innovative projects on community resilience in very different environments from uh, the South Pacific to Scotland and um, co-creative projects to build flood resilient uh, floating homes in Bangladesh. He's also very sort of action orientated and is actively involved in helping support and facilitate emergence of a growing field of research on action on trans transformations to sustainability. This includes convening the Transformations 2017 conference series, I hear there's a 2019 uh, coming up, and being a co-founder of the Sustainable Development Goal Transformation Forum and also trustee of H3Uni, which is an um, action-orientated organisation that seeks to promote transformative thinking and capacity for working within a changing world. So there's lots of mention of transformation. You see it in the title there. But finally, I think importantly, we should know that to, to find solace from a turbulent world and foster inspiration and support, he also spends time connecting with the non-human world, including with his dog. So. Over to you, Jaron. Thanks so much for the welcome, Zoe. It's a real, real pleasure to be here. I love giving these kinds of lectures because it gives me an opportunity to really talk about what I want to talk about. And I quite like my title of, um, of, of Professor of Social Dimensions of Environmental Change, or you could just call it Professor of Stuff, which is more, more broadly how I think about it, because I don't really know what to call myself either. Um, so um, you mentioned my dog. I was going to give a whole lecture about dogs, but then I decided not to. I thought it probably ought to be a bit, that would be a bit off piste, but uh, it's really nice to be here. Um, before I start, I just thought I'd give a quick dedication. These are my parents. Wave, Mum and Dad. A dedication to my parents. They're here this evening. Uh, the dog, I'm afraid. I, actually, I, I seriously thought of bringing him in, but I didn't, I didn't, it got too complicated with all the trains and things, but I was going to do something with that. Um, but my parents are here, and I, I'm, I'm going to dedicate this lecture to them, uh, because really it wouldn't have been without them that I would be here tonight. But the other thing is that everything I say, I'm just going to blame on them anyway. So, uh, so thanks, Mum and Dad, for, for everything that you've done. So, um, so, so that's the start. Um, uh, where I'm going to start with this lecture and what I'm going to talk about is a world of massive change that we're just about to enter. And we always talk about change, we always say the world's changing, but this time it really is. And, and, and what I'm then going to talk about is a little bit about how knowledge fits in that and what we mean by knowledge and why that's important and how we're all going to have to shift the ways in which we think about things. So I'm going to start by saying transformation is inevitable. Big change is inevitable. We've got, if you just take climate change as an example, climate change, whether we're going to meet the global targets to reduce carbon emissions by the huge amount we've got to reduce them, that if we're going to do that, that's going to take absolutely huge change. It's going to take massive change and we have to do it very quickly. If we don't meet them, we're going to get massive change anyway because the impacts of climate change, as they continue to accrue, are going to have massive impacts for everything that we do. Now, it's not just climate change. It's obesity. 
You know, obesity comes from the patterns and the ways in which society is organized. It's the mental health issues, it's the aging populations and all these sorts of things. So we are entering a period that is very, very different from anything that humanity has ever experienced before. And so um, the transformations are inevitable, and I'm going to come back right back to that at the end. And what I'm going to talk about through the, through the lecture this evening is give you some examples, a particular example of where this is really starting to have an impact, which is in Louisiana in the southern US. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about some of the reasons why this has occurred, and then I'm going to talk about uh, some of the things we might need to think about uh, as we go, go on in, in terms of how we think about learning and how we think about how we engage with some of the challenges that we're facing. So the Great Acceleration, some of you will be familiar with, this, with these sets of slides. This is from Will Steffen's work. And basically what it's saying is that the period that we're in now is huge, huge change. It doesn't really matter what uh, measure you look at, uh, but those, those measures are increasing at an exponential, uh, exponential rate, mostly from the 1950s. So on this slide here, these are all just different graphs. So this is water use, paper production, fertilizer consumption, foreign direct investment. And this is basically 1950 here, so you've got this exponential growth in these socio-economic trends since 1950s, these huge changes that are happening. And then that was all translating into these biophysical changes, surface tem temperature, ocean acidification, coastal nitrogen, shrimp aquaculture, etc., etc., etc. So the changes that we're now experiencing are huge and they're happening very, very, very quickly. And at global levels, uh, this is having huge impacts. Now the really interesting thing when you think about this in relation to climate change that I'll, I'll, I'll be talk, mostly talking about today is it brings a whole bunch of kinds of emergencies. And really it's more than just one kind of emergency. So we have these real emergencies. Yes, there's an emergency that some islands in the Pacific are disappearing because of sea level rise. Yes, there are some emergencies where there are droughts where people can't produce enough food. Yes, there are emergencies by increased storm, storm intens intensity and frequency. These are all immediate emergencies. These are the real emergencies. But it's also bringing what we call conceptual emergencies. How do we deal with this? This is stuff we've never had to deal with before. How do we deal with the fact that climate change is, is, is emerging as a set of a whole bunch of different activities, the way societies are organized, the way our transport networks work, the way we produce food, the way we consume, consume food? We don't, have the, we don't yet really have the thinking, thinking to address these sorts of things. And then we come into what we call the existential emergencies, which I'll go into in a moment. So I'm going to draw this out in, in just one example where we've been doing some of the work recently, which is in Louisiana in the southern US. Um, and if you don't know where Louisiana is, Louisiana is this little state down here, about 4 million people. Um, it's in the southern US uh, on, the, on, on the Gulf of Mexico. Now the interesting thing about almost the whole of Louisiana is built on the sediment that runs down the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River covers about 40% of the US catchment. So 40% of the water that flows out of the US is tending to go down the Mississippi River in, that, in, in terms of that geographical catchment area. And so over the last seven, eight, ten thousand 10,000 years, the sediment that comes down that river has built Louisiana. So it's flowed out in what they call the distributaries. Imagine fingers of rivers coming out into the Gulf and you get all the sediment that, that flows down there. And as that sediment flows, you tend to get the highest ground next to the rivers because that's where the sediment forms and that's where the banks form and that's where the historical human development has been along these rivers so this was a flight we took over the delta um, about six weeks ago so these are really recent pictures um, and you get these towns a bit further inland in louisiana sort of 40 50 60 000 people um, that are quite close to the coast but still in very flat flat lying areas and the storm surges that come from the, the from the um the hurricanes that are increasingly hitting and in terms of their intensity and frequency, hitting the coast of, of, of the southern US are creating huge damages in that very, very flat land. Now, the interesting thing about this whole area, though, is that uh, in 1926, there was a huge flood. It had a massive impact on New Orleans, almost wiped out New Orleans. As a result of that, that, that flood, a whole huge amount of uh, uh, levees were built to try and stop the, the river from fl flooding. What that did, though, is it constrained the river and it then constrained the sediment flows, which then constrained the build-up of the sediment in the coastal region. And if you, once you constrain that, you start to lose the build-up of that land, and it dries out and starts to sink. At the same time, you had all this oil exploration in the coastal region, which opened up channels, which meant that the, the, the salinity, saline water came in, destroyed the vegetation, and so on and so on, to a point where you get land loss in that region as a whole. At the same time, you've got sea level rise, so you've got the sea going up, 
and the land going down and what they have is called relative sea level rise. So it has a huge, huge impact in this whole coastal zone, partly due to climate change, partly due to, to other human activities in the region. And this, uh, this diagram here is southern Louisiana, so Louisiana goes up something like this. Um, that's New Orleans up in here. All this red area is the predicted land that will be lost uh, within 40, 50 years. Right, so that's in the high climate change scenario. There's different scenarios of it. The green is where it's still building, where you've got sediment coming down. But all of this land will be lost. Something like three or 400,000 people will literally have to move. But in fact, some are already having to move now. So there is literally one community that is being, being moved and relocated, uh, which is no mean feat, given that many of the people rely on the coastal areas as well for their livelihoods and so on too. So this is a huge, huge problem that is starting to affect uh, the coastal region of Louisiana. Another 1.2 million people in places like New Orleans, effectively in this scenario, New Orleans becomes an island, right? So uh, increased exposure to storm surges and things like that. And this is all the way across the southern US. This is Florida. This is a whole bunch of other states uh, that, that are experiencing similar sorts of challenges. Um, well, fortunately, the governor is starting to realize this, and, and we've been involved in some work working with the governor and his senior staff, that's the governor in the background there, um, looking at starting to ask this question, well, what do we deal with this? How do, how do we start dealing with this? And, and one of the challenges that they're, they're facing is just the questions of how do you govern in a situation like this? How do you deal with the fact that you've got 300, 400,000 people plus another 1, 1 million or so people that are going to be affected by this, which affects the whole economies of the area, which affects the identities of people in terms of their, what it means to be living in Louisiana, what it means to be a Louisianan? How do you deal with that? Especially when all your agencies and your government departments, they've, they've developed as single sort of base agencies and silos. So you've got the education department saying, oh, we'd like to build a, 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 um, a, a new school here. And somebody else is saying, but that's not going to be there in 15 to 20 years. Literally. So these are really major, 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 major issues that are raising new challenges about literally the way they govern, about how the regulations are set, how they work together more effectively in a system that has just not been set up to deal with this at all. So that's what I mean by these conceptual challenges that they're facing in relation to the emergencies. And they don't have any answers. Humanity doesn't really have any answers for this yet. right? And so that's the, were the big challenges that are coming out. And on top of that then is this existential questions. Most of the income uh, in, and the, uh, the economy in Louisiana is either from serving military bases or from uh, oil and gas in the Gulf. And so much of the money that's actually being used to do a lot of the work in terms of adapting to climate change in the coast is coming from the money that came from the, the damage that was created by the, the legal money that came out from the damage that was created by the Deep Horizon oil spill a few years ago, which did huge amounts of damage as well. So there's this irony that a lot of the, the, the work in itself is being driven by uh, a, an economy that is driving some of the problems from climate change and so on. So it asks existential questions about, what are we doing here? Why, why are we trying to do this? What, what, what are our economies supposed to be doing? And, and, and these sort of challenges as well, that then influ influence the ways in which you can deal with some of the conceptual issues that are happening. So it's raising really major challenges. And I think of Louisiana as a bit of an analogy for the rest of the world, in the sense that um, many other parts of the world are starting to see these sorts of things. I live, live up in Scotland. Uh, rainfall has doubled since 1960s on the West Coast. Temperatures have already risen by two degrees centigrade since the 1960s in, in southern Scotland. These changes are coming our way, whether we think they're, whether we're directly experiencing them or not at this time. So for the whole world, it raises all of these different kinds of emergencies, something that we haven't been dealing with um, uh, uh, as a, as a, as a, in terms of humanity as a whole. I think it's kind of leading to these sorts of things. This is a picture um, that one of my uh, students um, saw in, uh, in a bookshop in, in a window in a bookshop in Glasgow recently. I think it's fantastic. Um, you know, please note the post-apocalyptic fiction section has been moved to current affairs. And then sometimes it leaves us feeling like this, you know, staring into the abyss of going, crikey, I can't cope with this. I think I'll just carry on going, go and do my Christmas shopping or something. You know, right? So, so this, this, this sense of the enormity of the problem is, 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 is crazy. We can't, we can't conceptualize this. We don't have the cognitive tools to deal with the enormity of the challenges that we're, we're being faced with. And so we just carry on as normal. So that's the kind of background. That's what I mean by the changes that are coming. Whether we like it or not, it's going to happen. Something is going to happen. Something is going to change. Um, so the question, the title that I had was Transformations and Knowledge, or Knowledge and Transformation. So what has knowledge got to do with all this? Well, we have to look back quite a long way back 
to, to understand some of the emergence of the problem. And much of the challenges that we're facing, whether it's obesity or mental health, these challenges of the 21st century or climate change, they've emerged from the last three or 400 years of scientific development and, techn and associated technological development. That's brought us phenomenal benefits, fantastic things. We wouldn't be standing here today, me giving a lecture on some PowerPoint presentation without those sorts of benefits. So there's no doubt it's brought phenomenal benefits. But what we often forget is it also has created many of these problems that we're now facing. I'm going to give you a one slide version of the history of science and, uh, and, and, and research uh, in, in just one slide. Essentially what started to happen it was, was in the 14th century we had what was the, the Renaissance, that was the rebirth, that was this notion that the Greek and Roman philosophies were brought back into the fore, this idea uh, that uh, we could have a rationalist outlook that human agency, the ability of humans to affect things and to make decisions um, was also important. It wasn't just divine intervention. It wasn't just everything happened because of, because of God or something like that. So that came, started to come back into the fore. That led to the scientific revolutions, so where we had systematic experiments, mechanical, ma mathematical views of the world, and the whole idea there was to try and observe with an open mind. There was a recognition growing that our perceptions were limited, so somehow we did, had to step back from that and observe the world with a much more open mind, and recognize that we're always affecting what, what we see. And this was a major advance. Uh, one of the key uh, uh, individuals involved in this was De uh, René Descartes, um, and he really put this point very strongly that perception is not reliable. What we see and what we experience is not really reliable or necessarily valid. Um, and he really came up with this idea that we, we then could be, it was possible to be separate from what we observe. You step back from it and kind of watch it from an outside. And that, that made things much more objective. That was his notion about that. You know, you just think of the analogy, um, I drag myself out of bed, right? I'm lying in bed, I can't get up, so I'm going to drag myself out. Something about my mind is going to be able to allow me to drag myself out of bed. And there's this sort of mind-body mind separation thing was considered to be possible, a way of thinking that would allow us to, to understand things better and more effectively. That then led to the Enlightenment, which became the age of reason in the 18th century. It's very much tied in with the Industrial Revolution. Uh, we got sociology, economics, law, politics, universities, libraries, and so on. Lots of tech and science, steam engines, um, uh, uh, hot air balloons, all that sort of stuff. And, a, and an emphasis on free speech and thought and the separation of, uh, of, of the state to a good degree from, uh, from religion. Uh, and the argument for a society based on reason, not faith. So again, there was this, this, this sort of uh, pre, uh, uh, occupation with trying to step back and observe things in some kind of objective manner. And that brought phenomenal benefits. All sorts of huge benefits that came out of the Industrial Revolution. All sorts of things. Lots of challenges, but lots and lots of benefits uh, that have effectively made the society that we're in today. The cars that we have, the computers that we have, the way things are driven, our, our understanding of... Uh, of, of data and all these sorts of things came out from that. But the problem is we also forget that it also created many of the problems we now face. There's lots of kinds of challenges involved. I'm just going to talk about two of them. The most obvious one is that it brought us intentional destruction. You know, our capacity to, to kill other people through war and the technological advances that, that, that has enabled that is just phenomenal. What we can do now in terms of harming others is just amazing. And of course that all drove a lot of the colonization of other places and, and the, the peoples that that affected. But the one I really want to focus on is the second one, which is the unintentional consequences. If you imagine the way in which our society is organized, our, our mobility patterns, that affects the diets that we have, or the mobility and how much exercise we're getting, the, the, the food systems that we have, taking one thing from one part of the planet to the next, that kind of complexity of things is contributing to the kinds of things we're now starting to see that are emerging that are coming out of those patterns obesity, mental health, climate change, those sorts of things. And these are, these are new kinds of challenges, and you can't address them just by one kind of magic bullet. The only way to address them is to start looking at the systems that are generating these sorts of problems. And that's difficult for us because we don't know how to do that very well. We're not very good at dealing with things at that kind of level. Um, and it reminds me, I think, this whole story, that the analogy, I was trying to think of a good analogy of this. Um, so we've got these lots of benefits coming out of science and technology, and for sure, and all these destructive capabilities and these new problems that are starting to emerge out of the patterns of how all this is related to. And I was trying to think of the best analogy for this. Um, and I came up with this one. 
Um, I'm going to have to do, I'm going to put some music on. So this is, this is the test for you guys now. I want you to see if you can identify this piece of music or what it actually reminds you of, perhaps. Take me a second to get this going. Hands up if you think, don't say anything. Hands up if you start getting something. Right, just a couple going. If you're at the front, it's always the older ones. <laughs> Any others? Keep going, listen. So how many have got? Who, how many think they might know what this is? Well, it's, well, it's related. Okay, let's have some thoughts. Somebody from the younger, about yourself. What do you reckon? Yeah. Fantasia. Yeah. So Fantasia is from is from from the film Fantasia. Te somebody tell me something else. Sorcerer's Apprentice. Okay. Yeah. Anybody know who it's by? Yeah, Paul Ducasse. Yeah, very good. It's about seventeen uh, eighties. No, sorry, eighteen nineties. <laughs> Um, any other thoughts? Okay, right, let me turn that off. So that's the music. Oh, I can't turn it off, that's the whole point about the, if you know the story, it doesn't stop. It gets worse and worse. Right, okay, so, um, so the story is really important because, um, the, the, so the, the mu piece of music's from Paul Ducat, and it's um, called the, it's basically called The Sorcerer's Apprentice. Um, and, it, and it's a, a piece of music that was used in the film Fantasia, which was the third Disney animated film that came out, so 1940s. Um, and um, it's all based on this poem by Goethe, uh, 1779, translated by Paul Dryson. Um, and the story, if you don't know the story, um, is a really interesting one. You have this wizard or a sorcerer in a castle, and he has an apprentice. And the apprentice um, is doing all the hard graft work. You know, it's that usual sort of apprentice, you know, teacher type sort of relationship. Um, and, uh, and, the, um, uh, and the apprentice um, is there and the wizard says, well, I've got to go out for a couple of days. So he goes out for a couple of days, but he says, by the time I come back, I want you to have washed the whole castle, cleaned the whole castle. I want it spick and span by the time I come back. So the wizard goes away and the apprentice is standing there and he's going, right, okay, and he starts getting the broom out and the, and, the, and the buckets and the water and things. And he says, oh, crikey, this is really hard. Now, if the wizard was doing it, he'd just wave his magic wand, right? So he goes to the spell book and he finds the spell for this, uh, for this thing that he wants to do and he magics up the, the broom and the buckets and the mops doing the work themselves. But once he starts it, he realizes he can't stop it. And they produce more and more water, so the whole thing is flooding. It goes completely out of control and he realizes he can't do anything. So in his desperation, he gets an ax and he chops up the, the, uh, the, the mops in, into lots of little splinters, but suddenly they grow into lots of other different mops and they carry on and carry on and carry on. And it gets really crazy and he's completely out of control. Eventually the wizard comes back and the wizard goes, bam, stops it all. And, and, you know, that, that's the, and, the, and the apprentice sort of eats this big piece of humble pie. Um, but the, the, the key thing about the wizard, sometimes he's angry and sometimes he's not. In some of the stories, he's just amused, right? So, that's the kind of story. And here's a bit of the original uh, poem, and it goes like this. For the magic charm and doing what I did I have forgotten. Be a broom, be not renewing, now your efforts spell begotten. Still his work abhorrent does the wretch resume, where I look a torrent threatens me with doom. You hells miscreate abortion, is this house doomed to perdition? Signs I see in every portion of impending demolition. Servant cursed and senseless, do obey my will. Be a broom defenseless, be a stick, stand still but he can't control it. It just doesn't stop. And that's the whole point of the story is that he's unleashed something that he can't control and he doesn't necessarily have the wisdom in order to, to understand what's going on there. Now, that's one version of the story and a colleague of mine that I do a lot of work with, a guy called Tony Hodgson, who's been thinking about this sort of thing for the last four or five decades, um, his version of the story is, and his analogy to the world that, that we are in now, is the, the key difference is that the wizard doesn't come back. So this guy is there for two days, he's waiting for the wizard to come back because he's completely out of control, but the wizard doesn't come back because there is no wizard, right? And that's the situation we're in today. In the world that we're in, we're in this world where we've unleashed over the last three or 400 years a huge amount of things, and they've been amazing, they've started cleaning things, but it's all out of control. 
And we've got to completely learn and relearn how we're going to engage with this and how we deal with this, because it's not going away. And, and that's the, the analogy that, that, I, that I think is quite useful um, for identifying and thinking about the kinds of things um, and the challenges that we're dealing with now. It's kind of a bit like that. So, where does that leave us? Right? In a world of wizards, where, where, in a world of change where there are no wizards, what do we do? How do we approach this? Lots of answers to this, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through five key things that I've thought are important in terms of some of the work that I've been doing, uh, in terms of how we think about it. So the first one, uh, let me just go through them in, in turn like this. Hold on. Okay, the first thing is that we need to recognise we're all apprentices. We are not wizards, right? So that, in, the, in the case of the story that I talked about there, the, the young apprentice is wandering around and he thinks, yeah, I just need to use a spell, that's okay. I don't need to have developed that level of knowledge uh, uh, that the wizard might have. I can just do it, right? And, and that's partly from thinking that we're already wizards in the first place. In the world we now find ourselves, none of us are wizards, right? So that requires very different ways of working and going back to thinking that we might need to unlearn some of the things we learned before. And starting with that level of humility will be really, really important. In the case of Louisiana, this is the community Ile de Jean Charles. It's actually being moved at the moment. It's no longer viable. We don't know how to do that, really. We don't know where, how we can move people to a, a safe place. Where is a safe place? If you're reliant on the, the food that you get literally from the coast to supplement your own food, because there are very poor families here, if you move them somewhere else where they're separate from that, they don't have their networks and their access to those sorts of things. It's not a straightforward thing to do. Um, what that also requires is unleashing lots of creativity. Um, this is a, a bit of work we've been doing in Bangladesh. I'm not going to go to in, to into it in too much detail, um, but the idea there was that we, we had this imagined idea of these floating homes, but these floating homes wouldn't just be floating structures, they'd be floating little mini farms with, um, with uh, vegetation on the walls and chickens on the verandas, so that a family in the five months that they might be inundated for in these places, because you get these really long lasting floods, can actually continue to survive in that process. And these integrated homes with renewable energy and all these different ty types of systems that were in there were actually designed um, in collaboration with some of the women from some of the poorest families uh, in the community as well. And so that unleashing that creativity and allowing others to come in and to, 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 to make something that you imagine real and to show it's possible uh, is really important in there as well. I'm not saying that's a major solution. I think there's some big challenges with it, but it kind of makes this point that, that we need to unleash creativity at a scale we've probably not ever done before. Um, we also need to focus on much more diverse kinds of knowledge. We tend to think of scientific knowledge or academic knowledge, the stuff that's in the books is, is really important, the PowerPoint presentations, right, that sort of stuff, and that's how we tend to think about what knowledge is, and yet there's a whole diverse array of different kinds of knowledge out there that are really important. If you look at all the large government reports, intergovernmental reports, like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity Ecosystem Services, all these different big things that have been coming out saying, there's a big problem, there's a big problem. They're mostly focusing on research and knowledge that is about the problem. They don't tell, what, tell you what the solutions are, and yet all the policy professionals are going, tell us what to do. We, we want to know what, what we should be doing. So we're focusing on producing lots of knowledge about the problem, but not really much about the solution or how you go about implementing them. In research, I did a quick survey of a whole bunch of research papers on climate change. 90% roughly on understanding the problem, about 8% on then identifying solutions, and about 82% on, on how you put them into practice. So we, despite the questions now being about how do we deal with this stuff, we're not focusing on it in, in many circles of, uh, of the work that we do. And this is really important. I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but essentially, this is, Arist this is going about 2,000 years, and Aristotle's ideas of what counts as knowledge. You have what they call the epistemic knowledge, that's the stuff you get in books, the stuff we can write down, the stuff we can talk about, the stuff we can articulate. But you also need other kinds of knowledge if you want to get into the know-how. So the technique, know-how knowledge is, you know, how do I hold a microphone, how do I use that? I can't explain that. It's very d difficult to do that in a PowerPoint presentation, or how do I drive a car, something like that. And then you've got this phrenesis stuff, which is uh, uh, bringing in, so I'll talk about that in a moment, but it's about the values and things that come inside that. How do I know if I'm doing it for the right reason or for the good end? Now, the interesting thing about our apprentice is that the apprentice started by reading something out of a book. He read a spell, 
he could do that, he could do the epistemic knowledge stuff, but he didn't have the know-how knowledge to work with it. He didn't have that practical skill that's part of us, that takes many, many hours of practice, or many years of development, or the wisdom to do that as well. So he, he, he lacked that as an apprentice, he didn't know how to do it. So the analogy here is, is a bit like if you want to learn to ride a bicycle, you've got to get on and fall off. You can't do it just, just by watching a PowerPoint presentation. If we want to get to the how do we solve the problems, we need different kinds of knowledge too. We need to recognise the different kinds of knowledge and much of what we produce in universities is not that kind of knowledge. Right? So that's a, that's a big challenge. Um, I'm going to skip that bit. Um, the, um, the third bit relates to the last one is that the, our apprentice in our story, um, as I said, he didn't have the technical knowledge of, of managing stuff, but he didn't really have the wisdom. He didn't really have the wisdom to say, why am I doing this in the first place? Am I doing it because I really don't like hard work and I just can't be bothered and I just want to find a magic solution? Or is he stepping back and going, well, what would happen if I did this? Have I really thought through what the implications might be? Have I thought through what might I be lacking in terms of the knowledge that I have? that gives me the opportunity to, to work with this in an effective way. Um, and if you think about the word wizard, the word wizard is very closely related to wisdom. In fact, that's where wizard comes from, or wise and wisdom and wizard. So all of those things are closely related. And we're not wizards. We haven't necessarily developed the wisdom yet to deal with this stuff. And that's exactly what some of the academics are saying. That's exactly right. So this guy is a, um, a, um, a public health researcher, very well known very key, um, key advocate of science, but he says we've produced lots of knowledge through, through science. We haven't done very well at integrating it with our ethics and our aesthetics, what is good and right and what is beautiful. We don't do that very well. We produce lots and lots of knowledge. This is what Nicholas Maxwell says. He says, the last 300 years, we've developed lots of great methods for producing knowledge. We're fantastic at producing knowledge. We can produce lots and lots and lots and lots of knowledge. It's everywhere. You know, it's impossible to keep up with it. But have we learned the wisdom of how to act and work in the world? No, we haven't. And that's really key. Um, another one, Andreas Clay, talks about the lack of accountability to, of science to society, and that relates back to Nicholas and, uh, uh, and uh, um, Phil Hanlon's work as well. And that's really critical. It raises important questions about what is a university for? What are we trying to do? What's this all about? And related to that, then, is the need to ask these deep questions of ourselves. Um, and this is, um, uh, this is the other thing about The Apprentice. Maybe he didn't really stop and ask these questions. What do I know? Why am I doing things? What is right? What is wrong? Um, this is an interesting picture. Um, it's a picture by Diego Velázquez de Silva in 1656. Is anybody familiar with this painting? Has anybody seen it before? It's a very famous painting. Very famous painting for lots of reasons, and I'm going to get you to think about this for a moment. So in this painting, there's lots of examples of reflection. Different things reflecting on each other in different ways. So I'd like you to turn to somebody maybe you don't know, or you don't know very well, and just, just have a quick chat about where do you see these different examples of reflection in this painting? There's lots of different ones in there. So what are the different kind of examples of, of reflections that are happening in this painting? I'm going to give you a couple of minutes. Off you go. Let's uh, get, some, get some thoughts, um, just maybe one at a time, just sort of point something out. Let's start. Anybody at the back? Hands up. Anybody want to share something? No, there's nothing wrong in all this. There's no, there's no trick. It's just what you see. Well, you brought a dog in a way that sort of seems to be lost in thought and reflecting about what that's right, the dog's looking at his feet going, crikey, what am I in this painting anyway? <laughs> Something like that, good. Excellent. <laughs> what else, what else have we got? Other examples of reflections? Nice one. Painting reflected. Does it look like there's a mirror on the back wall? The mirror on the back wall is reflecting, reflecting back. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's sort of, there's a reflection of, of a sort of reflection of what's going on. It's kind of a complicated, messes with your head, that one. Yep. No, the reflection is actually in a couple that's sitting for the painter. The painter is actually painting the couple that are in the mirror. The, the, these two, you mean? Yeah. These two, yes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And the painter is painting the Yes, so you can see the painter sort of reflecting. That's what the painter is seeing as he's, as he's doing the painting. Yeah, excellent. Really good. Yep, good. Other thoughts? There's loads in here. Yep. Um, so the, um, the little girl and the, um, the woman to the, 
to the right of that. This one? Oh, and that's what you want. Yeah. Is um, kind of this like imitating each other? Yeah. On that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so there's sort of copying going on as a bit of a reflect. That's a good one. I hadn't seen that one before. That's great. Um, others? Other thoughts? Yep. Yeah, I see a sort of broken mirror reflection between two girls in white and two girls in blue. Yep. And especially in contrast in colour, one's bright, one's much darker. One's what maybe seems classically beautiful, the others are. Yep. Yeah, there's a sort of mirroring that, that these are sort of almost caricatured sort of type people in a way, aren't they, with different coloured um, clothing versus these. Is that, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Great. Excellent. So there's that reflection that's happening in there. Other thoughts? Keep going. It's almost endless in this painting. Yeah, so, you might, so it's raising questions about who are you anyway and, and what's going on there in terms of there's so many people looking at you as, as a person that it's inviting you to reflect on why are they looking at me, almost, because it's happening all over the place. I like that one as well. Any other thoughts? Last one. Yeah. The people who are being painted are actually kind of in the position that we're in. Because yes. um, we're in front of the painting and we're looking at the painting. Yeah. This is where they are. Yeah. The yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there's this complex thing going on between the painter and the uh, and the painted as well. Yeah, and I'll, I'll come into that in a moment. Yeah, there's lots of stuff in here, and there's lots of written around this painting as to what all this means. Um, this is what I draw out of it a little bit. Um, uh, the first is that this is actually interesting. It's a reflection because it's a painting about painting. Somebody is painting painting, which is kind of interesting. So to me, that's a bit like it's not entirely right, but it's a bit like the real emergencies. You know. What are, how can we do things that we're already doing better? How can I do my painting better? Hormone. You could be thinking about it in those ways. Um, the second thing is that the painter makes himself the object. So the, so the painter's also painting himself, which is kind of interesting. So there's a self-reflective bit going on there. You never know, but maybe he's asking, how can I do this differently? Should I even be doing a painting? It's almost like the conceptual sort of stuff uh, that we talked about earlier. Um, so there's those sorts of things going on. And this is one, this third one is, you don't know this unless you know some context of the painting. But the interesting thing is that these are, I think these two are, are the royals, and it's quite interesting, they're the ones who've commissioned the painting. So they're paying, paying the painter to do the painting, which raises some interesting questions for the painter around, um, you know, what's driving this? Is this really my creative work? Or is it influenced by those who are paying it? And what's the social and historical context that is driving that? Where are the power relations happening in this? And where does that all happen? And what he's done there has, has already been highlighted. These are, these are sort of slightly caricatured people. So there's a bit of a joke going on there, something about something that's going on about this relationship that's happening in that painting. So whilst there's lots and lots of reflections in this, there's a sort of deeper kind of question, set of questions that are coming out around this painting. And the point I'm making really here is that, that our apprentice going back to our sources apprentice, um, the, the apprentice needs to re re learn to reflect on much, a much wider diversity of things. They need to step back and think about where are my assumptions coming from? What is driving the way I'm thinking about this stuff? And, and that gets back to some of the existential issues around economics that I was talking about in Louisiana as well. So that, that ability to reflect and, and the, 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 the disposition to be disposed towards stop, stepping back and thinking critically is, is really, really important because it is often our perceptions that are driving what we do and the behavior that, that we, we take. So that's really key. And the fifth thing that I want to talk about briefly is about um, learning, because all those other four things, the, um, the need for new approaches, thinking, creativity, the need to develop know-how knowledge uh, and, and, and build that into what we do, the need to develop better wisdom or more wisdom or whatever, the dispositions to ask important questions and deep questions, these are all driven by how we think about learning and how we emancipate and we, we make things free such that learning can occur. And I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail, um, but I'm just going to give a couple of examples um, of, to get us thinking about what it actually means to learn. Um, I, I grew up in Wales, and in the Welsh language it's really interesting because there's only one word for teacher and learner, dwi'n dwi'n di or dwi'n dwi'n ordi, which means I'm teaching you, I'm learning from you. So the sense that a teacher is a learner and a learner is a teacher is really interesting. And that's exactly what Andrew Bell did in 1753 to 1832. Um, Andrew Bell was an Episcopalian uh, minister uh, up, up in Scotland, actually up near where I live in Fife in St. Andrews, and he went out at the end of the 1700s to Madras in India to teach the kids of uh, the, the soldiers of the East India Company. 
When he got there, though, he had a problem because there were no teachers. So, crikey, what do I do about that? No teachers. So what he did is he, st he started teaching the older boys to teach the younger kids. And of course, what he realized then was once the older boys were teaching the younger kids, they learned a lot too, right? So that process, as you're teaching, you're learning a lot in the way that you develop that. And by the time he died in the 1830s, there were 10 to 12,000 schools across the world, including in the UK, that were using this method uh, as, a, as a pedagogical method. And it sort of highlights the point that th there's, there's something in important there about how we think about teaching and learning. The other thing then, the other example is uh, Sugata Mitro, who's based in Newcastle University, is famous for the, have you ever heard of the computer in the hole in the wall experiments in India? Computer in the wall, maybe. Uh, essentially what he, in the slums in the 1990s, he was interested in trying to get computing in, into, into slum areas and poor kids in schools that had very little resources. So what he did is he put these computers in the wall and he left them. And he wanted to see what would happen to the kids if he did that. And he put these little cameras up so he could see what was happening. And effectively, what the, the, the long and short of the story is that, that he, um, he found that the kids had this phenomenal capacity for self-organized learning. They gathered around in groups, they played with stuff, and they figured it out. And then when they realized they needed a manual, so he gave them the manuals in English, they couldn't read English, so they figured out through the internet how they could learn English. And so they improved their language by playing with these computers, and the self-organized learning was just phenomenal, the outputs of it. But the important thing about the story is that one of the most... Uh, 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 one of the biggest constraints to the kids' learning was the presence of a teacher. So when a teacher was there, they tried to control the situation. The kids didn't learn anywhere near as effectively as they did before. So that raises some interesting questions, going back again to the wizard and the apprentice, and we're all apprentices, well, how do we open up the space for learning? What I find in my students, I'm 45, you'd think I'd be fairly technologically savvy. I'm not really. But even then, I'm not that old, I don't think, maybe I am, but my students, their capacity to deal with the technology is just so far better than me. I might as well be handing over some of the challenges to them and just going, getting on with it. And that's exactly what I do with my students. I get them doing change projects. At the beginning of the semester, I say, your task in this module is to go out and change something. I'll help facilitate it, but I can't really tell you what to do. Let's get on with it. So they go out and try and change something and they learn from that process, getting their hands dirty and so on. But again, it's about how we open up the spaces for learning. Uh, and, and then we start thinking about, well, the changes that are coming are phenomenal and huge. And that emancipation of learning is really important. Again, I don't want to go in, into this in too much detail, but we also have to recognize that the transformations are coming in the very sectors and higher education and the way we educate anyway. So the technological advances that are coming, so the MITs and the, uh, and the Stanfords of the world are investing huge amounts of money into machine learning to be able to do things like mark essays online and that sort of stuff, right? To reduce the human resources and time that goes into it. Whatever you think about that, there's good things and bad things. What that means, it'll completely change the nature of higher education. Imagine being able to uh, teach and train people through an online system where you're teaching hundreds of thousands of people for, I don't know, $5,000, $500 or whatever. Uh, and it completely wipes out and changes the nature of the, the systems of, and education in terms of competitiveness. Okay, so, um, so the major tech advances are coming, uh, and, and that, that's really important as well. And then you start thinking about the expertise that's emerging around change. That's often not held in universities. The, the expertise and change is in the entrepreneurs, those who are driving things forward and different approaches that they're making. That's out there. Changes in demand towards solution knowledge. A lot of the students that I teach now, they're not interested in the problems. They know there's a problem. They want to get into the solutions, and they want to go into those sorts of spaces. So I think we're looking at some quite major changes that will be coming in higher education uh, in, in different ways as we move into the world uh, of major change. So where have I got to? What have we been talking about? We talked about some of the challenges that are emerging, the big challenges, using the example of New Orleans. We talked about the emergence of science and technological advances brought many benefits, but also many challenges. Uh, we talked about the challenges of, of some of the things that we might need to focus on uh, if we're going to work within this new world of change that we have unleashed. Um, and, uh, uh, and that's led to some of these, these points I've been making about learning. And all of this, I'm an academic, I raise lots of questions, I don't necessarily provide answers. Um, but all of this raises lots and lots and lots of questions. What does it mean to teach and learn in a world where we're all apprentices? What does that mean? How does that affect how we, what we think uh, schools, colleges and universities are actually for? What are they for? What does this mean for how we produce knowledge, for the research that we do? Is it about problems? Is it about solutions? Um, how will these perspectives of knowledge themselves change as we transition through the challenges of the 21st century? 
How can we facilitate the changes in perspectives, knowledge and learning? And where will this learning journey take us? You know, the, we are going through such major changes. If we're going to come out the other end through these 21st century challenges, we're going to look very, very different than we do now. Steve Keen, an economist, uh, uh, recently was saying, I was listening to him on, on Radio 4, and he was saying that the, 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 it was the Second World War that got us out of the, of the depression in the 1930s. The presenter said, oh, what do we need? Is another war. Is that right? He said, no, 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 that's climate change. Climate change is going to change everything. Once, once the world wakes up to the fact that you've got to throw absolutely everything at it, the whole economies will shift. All of this is going to shift too. A whole universities are going to shift. What we focus on is going to shift. All of that. So transformation is inevitable. The knowledge systems that we also rely on, whether it's universities or research, is also going to change. We're probably talking at something like the last enlightenment that we'll sh we will go through. It's probably going to be bigger than that. Um, and we're going to move towards new perspectives on what is considered to be important and possible. And so even for maybe some of us who have forgotten what it's like to imagine and be creative, they will start to believe in things, uh, other, other things that other people still think might be possible. Here we go. Happy Christmas. I still believe in it. Thank you.